I've spoken at length about Black Lives Matter on this channel before. In August of 2020, I made a video called Where Does the BLM Money Go? Tracing the financials of the various donations from the website blacklivesmatter.org. Most of those donations went to Act Blue, a Democrat slush fund, though some of them obviously found their way into the hands of the people who run the various Black Lives Matter groups. We know this because I put out another video in April of 2021 called Living Your Principles, where we talked about the fact that the BLM organization leader, Patrice Kahn Colors, is a trained Marxist. A video clip of her talking about Marxism went viral that everyone on the internet has been using in their videos. We actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. Yeah, that one. Don't worry though, for variety's sake, I found another. Am I a Marxist? I'm a lot of things. I do believe in Marxism. It's a philosophy that I learned really early on in my organizing career. We were taught to learn about the systems that were criticizing capitalism. It came out in the spring of last year that Con Colors used the BLM money to buy multiple homes, including a secluded compound in Topanga Canyon. I did a few other BLM videos over the years, mainly talking about various individual acts of violence, both committed by and committed to black people, and how those events related or didn't relate, contrary to popular opinion, to Black Lives Matter as a movement. But we're talking about the financial side of things again today. The reason why? Well, because I came across this tweet. BLM is missing $60 million. The headquarters doesn't exist, and the leaders have disappeared. Where is the money? Oh. Also, uh, as a side note, nice job, Dr. Evil. First time I've ever seen a double looting. Oof. Jokes aside, what the hell is actually going on here? Well, let's start with this article from the Washington Examiner. BLM's millions unaccounted for after leaders quietly jump ship. No one appears to have been in charge at Black Lives Matter for months. The address it lists on tax forms is wrong, and the charity's two board members won't say who controls its $60 million bankroll. BLM's shocking lack of transparency surrounding its finances and operations raises major legal and ethical red flags, multiple charity experts told the Washington Examiner. Like a giant ghost ship full of treasure drifting in the night with no captain, no discernible crew, and no clear direction, Charity Watch Executive Director Laurie Stritton said of BLM. BLM co-founder Patrice Kahn Colors appointed two activists to serve as the group's senior directors following her resignation in May amid scrutiny over her personal finances. That's right, I didn't do a video on this. This went down after it went viral that Con Colors was buying so many houses with the BLM money. So she decided to fade from public view, taking a deal with Warner Brothers to work on BLM-related productions to the widespread laughter of everybody smart enough to know it was all a scam early on. BLM denied allegations that Con Colors spent BLM funds on her personal properties. However, BLM and other activist organizations under Con Colors' control offered contracts to an art company led by the father of her only child. I mean, I guess that's one way to launder money. Have your wealthy charity activist organization spend all of its cash buying your relative's overpriced African artwork that you can display around various cities calling it representation, and then peace out with your cut. The story here is that Damon Turner, head of a group that does music and art-based black activism called Trap Heels, went on a progressive podcast with like 20 views called What We Gon' Do, yes, that's actually the name of it, where he talks about the professional connection between his organization and Black Lives Matter through Patrice Con Colors. The way he words it, it sounds like they're just colleagues. And so like me and my team really like said with it, I originally wanted it to just be an album, you know, of trap inspired, inspirational music, which was corny as hell, but, um, you know, it turned more so into uh, what it is now because Patrice Colors of Black Lives Matter was invited by Afropunk to come to Atlanta in 2000, October 2017, uh, no, I'm sorry, October 2018, um, to do some cultural work out there. She knows I'm from Atlanta. She hit me and said, hey, what have you been working on? You know what I mean? Like, so I sent her the deck that I was working on. And that sort of gave us the opportunity to do this really cool art installation in the middle of a warehouse, we built a trap garden um, mm. with, a, with an old school Chevy Bel Air with like foliage hanging out of it, neon lights and things like that. We had like games and pillows on the floor and like we had cherry blossom trees and that became sort of like the destination for the festival that year. But later in the podcast, he describes a birthday celebration and how Con Colors was a major part of it, sounding more like a romantic partner. My brother, uh, one of the artists that I met is Million and Patrice, got me this like like 34 
34 pancakes, because I love pancakes. Uh, I, I know, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I can verify that. <laughs> Stacked like it was a cartoon. Stacked like a cartoon with a one candle on top of it, man. And like, and like that was the thing. And then like, you know, Patrice organized like my family and friends to like send like some videos. And I, my, you know, head of cinematography, Giovanni cut this really beautiful 20 minute like video of people just like loving me and all these things. And then after that, like she organized a fucking like a birthday, like quarantine birthday party in the parking lot of her gallery with like all the homies pulled up and like, <clears throat> You know, it just felt really, just like felt really beautiful, man. And on Con Colors' Instagram in 2019, she said, This past decade, I healed my relationship with Damon Turner. We entered the decade developing a friendship and then having a baby. Our breakup was painful and nasty, and nothing I'd ever imagined would be the outcome given my own personal and political practice as an abolitionist. But therapy and mediation between the two of us brought us to a place where he and I could be a team together, etc, etc. In other words, this guy is out here talking about Con Colors as if she's a business associate, where their two organizations, BLM and Trap Heels, are just entering into normal business deals. But in actuality, he's the father of her kid, they were in a relationship together and now they are close friends and she's funneling BLM money to her family through his organization. Also on her Instagram, I found an interview that she did as the head of a different charity organization called Dignity and Power Now, a prisoner activist group. Patrice Con Colors started that group in 2013 and public IRS records of the organization unearthed in June of 2021 showed that they told the IRS they made less than $50,000 in 2016. But the public records of two other groups, the Resnick Foundation and the California Initiative, show that those two organizations donated $225,000 to Dignity and Power Now in 2016. Nobody knows where that money went, but I think we can take a guess. Aside from BLM and Dignity and Power Now, Patrice Con Colors also founded Justice LA and the Justice Teams Network, groups that hosted Bernie Sanders in 2018, as well as Talcum X. All of these groups seem to be fronts established to shuffle money around. For example, in 2018, the Justice Teams Network received a $400,000 grant to give to Justice LA, where it turned out that Justice LA's fund was the same fund as Dignity and Power Now. Another group connected to all of this is Reform LA Jails, which were received more than 1.4 million in donations in 2019. Over half of that money was paid out to just four entities, and remember their names for later. $270,000 went to a consulting company owned by Shalomia Bowers, a person who works with Patrice Con Colors on Dignity and Power Now. $211,000 went to Asha Bendele as payment for services rendered for writing Con Colors' memoir. $205,000 to a consulting company called Janaya and Patrice Consulting, which Patrice Con Colors likely owns one half of. And $86,000 went to Trap Heels, that company run by Damon Turner, the father of Con Colors' child. Trap Heels also received $150,000 from BLM directly for running an election night live stream. I wish my live streams made that kind of money. So what I see happening here is that Patrice Con Colors and her colleagues and family all own these various LLCs and charity organizations and use them to obscure the shuffling around of money, the vast majority of which comes from people who are donating to Black Lives Matter, thinking they're helping with racial injustice. There's been the BLM Global Network Foundation, the BLM Global Network, the BLM Action Fund, BLM Grassroots, the BLM Political Action Committee, the BLM Global Network Project, the BLM Support Fund, all of which are different organizations that these people have their hands in, as well as Dignity and Power Now, the Justice Teams Network, and Justice LA, all run by the same clique, all of them shuffling money around. In fact, there's even a completely unrelated organization called the Black Lives Matter Foundation, which Google, Apple, and Microsoft all donated $4 million to without looking. And it turns out, it wasn't owned by anybody in this group, and in fact was a pro-police organization organization. <laughs> Whoops. The point is though, after the money has been laundered, after it's been shuffled through all of these fronts, it doesn't actually go into helping actual real charities that provide for the poor. It instead goes into the pockets of the people running the organizations. Now that we know a few more of the players, let's keep reading that Washington Examiner article and see if any familiar names pop up. Con Colors announced in May she was stepping down and that activists Makani Themba and Monifa Bandele would lead the organization as senior executives. But Themba and Bandele revealed in September that they never actually took the job because of disagreements with BLM's acting leadership council. Monifa Bandele, by the way, is the sister of Asha Bandele, the memoir writer who got $211,000. 
when an investigative reporter from the Intelligencer, who by the way was a black man, asked Bendele about the spending of Reform LA jails, he was called racist and sexist for daring to question them. Both Themba and Bendele told the Washington Examiner they do not know who took over as BLM's top executive after their departure, and neither would say who served on the council. The two remaining BLM board members, Shalomia Bowers and Raymond Howard, did not return numerous requests for comment, asking who has been in charge of BLM and its money since Colors left the charity in May. Bowers served as the treasurer for multiple activist organizations run by Con Colors, including a BLM PAC and a Los Angeles-based jail reform group that paid Colors $20,000 a month and dropped nearly $26,000 for meetings at a luxury Malibu Beach resort in 2019. Bowers declined to comment when reached by phone on Monday. Oh, there's another name we recognize. Shalomia Bowers, the person who got $270,000 from Reform LA Jails. Howard has spoken openly on Facebook about his work with BLM and his close relationship with Con Colors, but he appears to have recently taken steps to conceal his role within the charity. As recently as last Friday, his page was modified after the Washington Examiner contacted Howard for comment, and now states he serves as the Director of Operations for a nonprofit. A reference to Howard's position as the Finance and Operations Manager of New Impact Partners, a Dayton Ohio-based consulting firm owned by his sister was also removed from his LinkedIn profile. Also as recently as last Friday, a website for New Impact Partners attributed a quote to Raymond from Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation thanking the consulting firm for its help solving BLM's organizational challenges. The attribution was removed from the website after the Washington Examiner asked Howard how much BLM has paid his sister's firm. On Tuesday, a Washington Examiner reporter attempted to request BLM's 2020 tax form 990 in person at the charity's office in Los Angeles, which the group disclosed as the location its books are stored in in previous filings submitted to the IRS, only to be told by a security guard at that location there has never been a BLM office there. An unidentified BLM spokesperson informed the Washington Examiner on Thursday that the group does not currently maintain a permanent office, and offered to mail a copy of its 990 within two weeks. It seems to me that as soon as the public began to realize what was going on, these people began to bail out of the BLM organization. Con Colors and her huge home purchases went viral, and then she quietly slipped away. Two other people that Colors put in charge decided not to be the ones left holding the hot potato, and so they declined the offer. And then the final two, Bowers and Howard, were left holding the BLM bag, which they promptly emptied and then tried to conceal their involvement from the rest of the world. By the way, another of those properties that Con Colors has bought up? It's a historic building in Toronto, notably once home to the Canadian Communist Party. The $6.3 million used to buy the building, which was previously the Wild Seed Center for Art and Activism, was transferred from the Black Lives Matter charity to the Canadian charity M4BJ, which is run by Khan Colors' wife, Janaya Khan. And that name, Janaya Khan, that certainly sounds familiar as well. Perhaps that's the Janaya from Janaya and Patrice Consulting, the organization that received $205,000 from LA jails. I think there's a pretty good chance of it. Vice ran a story on these two in 2017. It's a fluff piece talking about their relationship with institutional oppression, with obvious appeals to slavery and their ancestry and all this other garbage. But fuck me, look at them. Do these people look poor to you? Do they look like they're living in a crack den in the ghetto? Obviously, regarding the ethics behind Black Lives Matter, nobody can object. Black people matter just as much as any other race of people. And if the point is that race-based injustices may still exist, that's obviously unacceptable. But at this point, it should be pretty clear what's going on here. Everyone who donated to BLM, the organization, the charity, the legal entity, got fucking played. I feel really sorry for all those poor people out there who might have gotten suckered into this, thinking that five extra bucks they had left over from their minimum wage job went to actually helping anybody, but instead it just lined the pockets of these grifters. There are many stories of Patrice Con Colors shafting other people through BLM. Tory Johnson began a group called BLM Huntington Beach after the death of George Floyd. He wanted to lead a counter-protest in response to a planned White Lives Matter event. Con Colors used her platform to denounce Johnson's event and demanded the movement focus on her own event happening at the same time instead. That public statement caused widespread support to be pulled from Johnson's event, basically leaving him high and dry. His counter-protest was overrun with violence from the White Lives Matter protest, and he was forced to flee from the scene by jumping into the car of another protester. All of the large activist groups had abandoned him after Con Colors made her statement, and he was basically left with no people or funds. Johnson later said, I don't tell people what I'm actually going through. I don't tell people how stressed I actually am. But you know, I actually have to live through all this. They got rich off my back. 
Regardless of how you feel about the BLN WLM dynamic here, it's clear that this guy is somebody on the ground who got fucked by the larger figures of his own movement because those larger figures wanted their paycheck. In the same vein, on July 25th, 2016, LA cops killed 18-year-old Richard Rishner. His mother, Lisa Simpson, no, not that one, got involved with the LA chapter of BLM. This time, the chapter was an official one, connected to Con Colors' larger BLM empire. The LA regional director, Melina Abdullah, asked for people to donate to BLM because Simpson needed $5,000 for her son's funeral. After the spotlight moved on, though, Simpson received nothing from the organization. BLM took the donations and cut ties with her. Simpson went public with her story, joining other people who feel like they've been used by BLM, with Simpson herself saying, the activists have events in our cities and have not given us anything substantial for using our loved ones' images and names on their flyers. Melina Abdullah's response to that was to post a video on her Instagram saying that BLM was under threat, and that part of that threat was the mainstream media using black voices to discredit BLM activists like her. There's a lot coming at us, and some of you have seen some things on social media, um, you've seen some um, attempts to discredit Black Lives Matter. I just want to also ask if you've seen or read um, Judas and the Black Messiah. And so I want us to just be really thoughtful and be students of history and to dig deep and not believe everything that you read or see, no matter who it's coming from. So, you know, there are people who are motivated by ego. Um, there's people who are motivated by whoever they might be working for, and sometimes they're working for um, folks other than the people. Um, but then there's also people who are manipulated, um, who have very real pain, and are manipulated by systems. And so it's important that we do our own research, that we do our own digging. Um, so. I, I don't want to repeat some of the accusations that have been made, but I want you to um, be clear. Is that my goddaughter? Hey, Erica. Um, <laughs> which one am I? What, what are you talking about? Melina Abdullah has her own history within the socialist space. Her grandfather was Gunter Reitman, a member of Germany's Communist Party and part of the underground resistance to the Nazi regime. Notably, he wrote the book Vampire Economy, a critique of national socialist economics and politics from an international socialist position. Her father was an open Trotskyist in the United States, and Melina herself is also involved in the money-go-round escapades of con colors and friends, operating front organizations to obscure payments. She's assaulted police at protests, she stood up for Jesse Smollett's ridiculous con, and she's an open supporter of Louis Farrakhan and his black supremacy movement. My name is Melina Abdullah. I'm an organizer with Black Lives Matter. I want to thank the Honorable Minister Farrakhan for having us. We are under siege, all of us. Pulling our pants up won't save us. Our college degrees won't save us. Middle class status won't save us. They've declared war on us. And the worst thing that we can do is to act as if we're at peace when we're really at war. Black Lives Matter is a rallying cry. It is not for us, for them, it is for us. Black Lives Matter is a recognition that we have all we need within us to win. Commit ourselves to the war that will dismantle the system of white supremacist patriarchal capitalism. That is what or else means. These are the people that the BLM money went to. Professional activists and revolutionaries who provide nothing to society but racial supremacy and communist agitation. Meanwhile, the majority of white leftists who helped BLM, they did so because it's an easy way to virtue signal. You drop a donation, you publish it on Twitter or Facebook, and now everyone knows that you're one of the good ones. You see, you're not racist, you're giving money to BLM. You've accepted that historic, that genetic sin that comes with your white skin. To the progressives, BLM functions as a Catholic indulgence. Pay enough money and your crimes are washed away. And the corrupt Marxist leaders of the whole organization ran off with the whole pot, as Marxists always do. There is not a single Marxist out there that truly cares about the people, the workers, the lower class, whatever you want to call it. They don't want to abolish hierarchy. They don't want the stateless, moneyless, classless society. They simply want to build their own power. That's how it is. That's how it always will be. 
And I know how these people justify it in their heads. They get a taste of the money. They see how it affects their life. They say, hey, now that I'm not worrying about making ends meet so much, I can do more activism. I can help more people. More of my time and energy is freed up for the cause. That's how it begins. They believe that helping themselves to the organization's bank account is helping others. And to a limited extent, it actually is, as long as they use that freed up time and energy, as well as most of the money, to actually help others. But they don't. They don't have the willpower to resist the corruption. They don't have the strength of character to take a fair cut for their work and then continue to labor for the betterment of the people they claim to speak for. Instead, they take and then take and then take, getting fatter and richer like the capitalist class they claim to hate while being a part of it, contributing no labor for their taking because they started this story by telling themselves that if they're better off, then that leads to other people also being better off. But they're not actually doing the work to make that connection valid. They're just enriching themselves. There actually is an entire underclass of black people who legitimately could use some help in the United States. You didn't actually think that the corpos and their bought and paid for Uncle Toms were going to assist them, did you? I don't know if it's worth us talking about communism because it it just has such a bad rap. Well, because yeah. it, it's failed every time. That's why it has a bad <laughs> But rap. so has capitalism. Absolutely. It's because the U.S. is so good at propaganda and being like this it has sold the idea of the american dream and that's tied into capitalism and wealth it's it's much harder to sell communism given that so much of the experiment has failed around the world 